And on the phone with us is Wyoming Superintendent of Public Construction, Jillian Baylor. Thanks for coming on this morning. You keep participating with us in these town halls, and I appreciate the time and the effort. Hey, thanks for having me, Glenn. And you guys do a great job of covering and reaching I'm um, reaching out far and wide to get different perspectives on the coronavirus and the major topics. Thank you. Well, we have to start with you today because this is all about you. Uh, we had to close <laughs> down at some point uh, Wyoming schools, and at some point we're looking toward how do we get things started again. Do we start school in the fall? And if we do, what does that look like? Because it can't look like it did before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, one thing that um, the governor has been really cautious about is not stepping out too quickly or too far, Um, and and I've appreciated that. So instead of following what other states did and closed down schools for the entire school year back in March, um, we slow-stepped it, and we went two weeks at a time and another two weeks and another two weeks, and some of the guidance changed along the way. And, um, and I anticipate that that's how we'll continue to move forward. Uh, at this point, we are planning on all schools reopening in the fall. Uh, but, of course, that's contingent on health guidance and the health and safety of our students, staff, and communities, uh, first and foremost. Well, let's take a look at how that might look. And we'll just go through the day here real quick. So people have to get on the bus. Buses mm-hmm. can be kind of cramped. You know, how do we, do we jam people in like we have before? Yeah, you know, there's people keep talking about getting back to normal or the new normal, and definitely there's going to be a new normal in education that will include social distancing at least for a while, and um, so schools will really need to consider what um, what their school bus configuration looks like, what their classroom configuration looks like, what their class day looks like, and um, and every school district will look a little bit different. So what you'll see, <clears throat> excuse me, what you'll see us doing, <coughs> I'm sorry, Glenn. It's all right. I got a little frog. Hey, that's all right. At least it's not <laughs> me for a change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least I get to turn off my microphone and clear my throat so nobody knows. There you go. I don't uh, have that um, <laughs> opportunity. But, you know, we have 48 school districts in the state, and every school district is going to approach it just a little bit differently, and that's okay. Um, some of our school buses already have social distancing on our r- rural routes, and um, it'll look really different. Um, what you'll see from us at the state level is uh, probably three buckets of guidance. One will be, hey, school districts and school boards that are locally elected to make these important uh, decisions uh, right where they should be, which is at the, the community level with input from the community. Um, these are the things that you should consider. Then from the state level, we'll also put put out some recommendations. These are things that every school should be doing, but they're not mandated. And then there will be a smaller subset of requirements. Every school district needs to be doing X, Y, and Z. Um, A lot of that will be to to comply with the CARES Act and things we already have have, uh, in place, and some of it will be health-related. So those are the three buckets that Wyoming families can can expect. And, um, and I would also expect and encourage Wyoming families to reach out to their locally elected school boards to give input on what that ought to look like. So we're going to have to have uh, meetings not just with the school boards and you, but with the school boards and parents in each and every community. So I would assume that's already underway? It is. Uh, yeah, every school district is beginning to work on this. Uh, over Overall, we're calling it Smart Start. And uh, at the state level, I'll, I'll just start from there. We have a working group that's comprised of educators, uh, some folks from the tech industry, and healthcare providers. Um, it's staffed by the Wyoming Department of Education, as well as the Wyoming Department of Health. And they're starting to think about those big topics. Uh, Not only are they thinking about them, but they're taking them back to their constituencies, like the school nurses and the superintendents and the teachers, and really beginning to have those conversations within each school, within each community. But we also have to to say, you know, that we we could have the best laid plan for schools, 
And if a family or a community isn't confident and comfortable sending their families back uh, or sending their kids back to school, that needs to be taken into consideration given these times. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty fond of, of thinking about public education as serving the public, and you know that about me, Glenn. And, um, and it's, it's, we, we've been struggling for a while before the pandemic, uh, but we can't expect to serve the public in the same way that we have. Uh, confidence has changed. Communities have changed. Health and safety protocols have changed. So as a result, public education needs to change, and we need to provide more flexibility and more options for families inside each school so that families feel comfortable. Uh, will there be some that, that continue to exercise other options? Yes, absolutely, and that's the way it should be. Now, Superintendent Bailo, um, speaking of flexibility and, and, and options, obviously during the pandemic has been a lot of distance education, um, virtual mm-hmm. tools, that kind of thing. How effective has that been, and, and how are you gauging um, the effectiveness? Yeah, well, first of all, hey, Nick, it's good to <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Good voice. morning. Nice to talk to you. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you know, we turned on a dime. Um, we went to school on Friday, and um, many of us across the state didn't go back on Monday, uh, March 16th, and and that was really rough. Um, I, I'm a big believer in disruption uh, and getting things done, but uh, that was a little too disruptive. Uh, nonetheless, we have an important obligation to, um, to transform education to meet the needs of students, and, um, and what I can say is that what we were doing prior to to March 16th was working for most kids pretty well. What we did after March 16th and to the end of the school year was working for fewer kids. Mm -hmm. Um, We did our best. Uh, Our teachers worked their tails off, but at the end of the day, uh, many of our teachers are not trained uh, on how to deliver remote education uh, effectively. And while we stood up as many tools and trainings as we could at both the state and local levels, um, it just wasn't where it needs to be. The reality uh, and, and the best options will lie somewhere in the middle, and there won't be a one-size-fits-all for all families or for all schools. So what I, what I would anticipate um, most school districts uh, looking like is uh, being able to be more flexible to shift from remote learning to in-class learning uh, much more quickly and much more effectively. Um, I see some schools doing a staggered schedule where maybe some kids would come one day and some kids would go the next. Um, I see school calendars possibly being extended. And again, these aren't requirements from the state, but these are the conversations that are happening in, in every community right now. Um, And and there are conversations that should be happening. So um, can we do better than we did um, from March 16th to the end of the school year? Absolutely. We weren't prepared for that. Um, Are we getting there? Yes, we are. Will it look like it has? I hope not. Will it look like it was? I hope not. Uh, Somewhere in the middle. So we have a lot of things to consider and a lot of local decisions to make. And again, I think one of the most important voices right now is the community voice, the voice of parents, the voice of um, community members. Uh, We're going to rely an awful lot on education partners like libraries and YMCAs and Boys and Girls Clubs to really help fill some of the learning gaps. We can't start a program like this on education during coronavirus without first talking to the Wyoming Superintendent of Public Instruction, who's been on hold with us for a few minutes for a news break. Jillian, I've got the ultimate question, and I don't know how any of our schools, you or any of our schools, as hard as you've been working, solve this one. You're dealing with kids who will be going back to school. I dare you to keep them from gathering together in groups in the hallways or elsewhere and and not social distancing like you want them to. You know, squirrel. Yeah. Yeah, well, with without a doubt, schools need to reopen, and they need to do so soon. Um, and given that, there are challenges, just like there are with every situation that we're facing right now. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um you know, from hugs and uh, hugs from kids and nose wipes and um, snapping masks 
<laughs> well, let, uh, and let's get into the high school years because that's when kids really get social, and they're going to get yeah, it. yeah. And uh, I mean, not only does school serve as um, as a place for academic skill development and success, but it promotes and develops social and emotional development. And um, part of that is, is, is touching and learning how to do that appropriately. And some of that is being in close proximity to people. And so there's just, there's not a way to avoid some of it. And, and frankly, I'm not sure that we should. Uh, we have to keep kids as safe as we can. We have to be mindful and, um, and realistic about the fact that we don't have a vaccine for COVID-19. Um, but, but there's a lot that we can do to prevent um, and, and still make a couple of mistakes. And I'm, I'm saying mistakes in air quotes, even though you can't see that, because a kindergarten hug or a hug from a kindergartner is not a mistake. Um, and it's not something we should be teaching kids not to do. But right now we need to put, to put up some boundaries until it's a little bit safer to do that. So I think we can do it, um, but it will always be a challenge from day to day. But that is not atypical, and that is not unlike every single other sector that is working on reopening or etching out the new normal right now. It's just that there are a few more people and a few more challenges uh, in, in, a, in an elementary, middle school, or high school classroom. And Superintendent, we've talked a lot about what the new normal is going to look like for, for kids in Wyoming's education system. Um, how are you making these changes for educators, and what has the impact been on them thus far? I mean, God, if, if you're having a tough time as a kid or as a parent with some of the distance learning, I can't imagine um, as a teacher trying to make that adaptation is going to be too easy right off the bat either. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Um, we, we're, we're providing a lot of, of professional development. I mean, immediately, within a couple of days, we were providing professional development for teachers on what we call our learning management system. For the parents out there, that's Canvas or Google Classrooms, um, the kind of the, the, the backroom function that puts us online um, as parents and kids with our teachers and mm-hmm. post assignments, etc. Uh, we also provided professional development on how to connect with kids. Um, online because it's much different than seeing them face to face, but but the bottom line is that's that's not enough. That's not adequate. It needs to be ongoing. We'll continue to provide professional development. That's really important. Another aspect of this that's really important is making sure that every family is connected and every school is connected to reliable broadband. Um, in most cases, that's twenty five m mbps or um, you know, I, I, now I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, there. Meg, 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 megabytes know, per second. Yeah, the, yeah, the speed. Thank you. I just know that 25 is kind of the number that we want to shoot for for families. And, um, you know, school districts did a great job of, of making accommodations for families that, that weren't connected. Um, our, our Wyoming companies, our Wyoming tech companies stepped up and they provided internet service for families all over the state, hmm. um, either on a short-term or long-term basis, but we need to continue doing that. And then we need to just think about what are our options, because there's, you know, there's, there's watching a class or, or taking part in a class that's live, um, which is called synchronous learning, um, and watching that from afar, maybe at home or from another venue. And then there's asynchronous learning, which is logging on anytime you want and accessing the assignments and doing the assignments and watching videos. Um, And so teachers don't really know the difference between that uh, or between those two types of learning because what we've done in brick-and-mortar education for years has mostly been face-to-face in the classroom learning. And so now we're adding two different paradigms to our teaching repertoire, and it's necessary, and it will improve education overall. But... um, but our teachers have to be quick studies, and well, they will. They'll step up and do it. And as you said, you, you and the whole department, every educator in Wyoming has had to turn on a dime to make this adaptation, and so we certainly applaud you for uh, the quick thinking and the effort and, and really the dedication to, to Wyoming families and, and the children. I mean, it's um, clearly making a big difference, and um, I, I think you're going to see a lot of support going into the fall from folks who all want to make this work just as well as we can. 
Well, absolutely we will, and, and, I, um, and I thank you for that. But I'll tell you what, the kudos really goes to the families, the students, and the teachers who made it all work. Um, and and it, it wasn't perfect. It was really messy. There are a lot of lessons learned. But I think the biggest success to take away from it is that education in a public school um, or any setting can be much more dynamic than what we have offered in the past. What? And um, it's unfortunate that it took a pandemic to, um, to lay that out. Nonetheless, um, we have improvements to make, um, and, and we'll step up and, and get that done. So as people get ready to go back to school, they got to start thinking about this now. As, and I know we haven't even got into the summer, but they got to start thinking about this now. We've got to start working on our procedures now. So for those parents who want to get involved, and frankly, they all need to be involved, what are the pathways? they got to go through the local school district? Who do they need to call? Yeah, you know, most school districts... Uh, uh, are, are offering some summer programs. Some of those are virtual, some of them aren't. Um, yesterday I just did a promo for the library, um, and they're doing a summer summer reading challenge with kids, and it's virtual, um, but there are prizes involved and lots of ways to stay motivated. So yes and, Glenn. Um, yes, talk to your, you know, especially if, if a parent is concerned that their students' academic skills have slipped over these last few months reach out to their teacher, reach out to the principal, reach out to the school district, take advantage of summer learning opportunities. There are also great websites, um, Discovery, PBS, uh, Code.org, um, Khan Academy, that are free for parents to use and, um, and for students to use as well. And then there are community resources as well. I mentioned the library. There are also others with Boys and Girls Clubs. And, um, and other partners in education that really want to make the best and the most of the, these, um, this situation in these times and offer kids as many opportunities as possible to sort of um, not only avoid the summer learning slump, but also make up for lost time um, if there was any these last few months of school. Um, so, so while it seems that schools are closed, um, which the school buildings for the most part are, I'm pretty fond of saying education is not closed, and it's more than just our schools that are educating kids over the summer, and I really would encourage parents and families to take part in any and all opportunities that, um, that are available in their communities. I like that. Education is not closed. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Okay, well, there's your tagline for your next article, Nick. There you go. Wellman School <laughs> Superintendent.